might be flexible. Okay, sounds sounds good. Um, thank you guys for uh, for inviting me here. It's exciting to I always love a chance to talk about uh, Berkeley GW and GW and BSE. Um, what I hope to cover today is material that um, I think you kind of already put to use in uh, some of the tutorials yesterday uh, and yesterday afternoon. Uh, but I hope to give you kind of more context, more information to, to really kind of understand what you all have been uh, doing and what you're going to continue doing in the tutorials this afternoon. Um, I want to thank uh, Philippe Hornada and Diana Ku for um, helping contribute to these slides uh, over the years. It's something that we've put together for these tutorials, and um, I think they put in a lot of the a lot of the work in creating creating the slides. Uh, maybe before I get going, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, um, just so you know who the who you're hearing from. So my uh, day job now is as uh, the application performance lead at NERSC. So I work with HPC uh, application teams from all sorts of different domains, from uh, the material science, chemistry, condensed matter physics area. Um, that is my background, all the way to like the climate modeling and astrophysics and, and other domains um, on um, helping those teams prepare their applications for HPC systems. Um, but I am really happy to have a chance to continue collaborating with the Berkeley GW project, which is a group that um, I did my PhD with in, in Berkeley. And during that time that I was a graduate student, we put together kind of the 1.0 version of Berkeley GW, the code had I think kind of evolved over decades before then um, in a sort of or organic way. And I think we took the opportunity when I was a grad, graduate student to kind of publish the first official release of the of the code. And so something that I'm, you know, is kind of near and dear to my heart and always excited to talk about. Um, so with that, let's let's uh, kind of get to it. Um, so I think you've kind of heard about this from the other speakers already, but just to just kind of as a reminder, why use or choose Berkeley GW in this many body perturbation theory space? Um, and so one is that one of our goals for the code is to be the kind of the, the, um, uh, the kind of standard bearer in this space or like the most uh, production quality feature full code in this space. And so part of that is providing these types of characteristics. And one is versatility. Uh, so we kind of support um, every type of application um, or material that you can that you can kind of think of from 3D bulk crystalline systems to 2D systems like graphene, 1D systems like nanotubes, um, and e even sort of 0D systems like molecules. Um, uh, where one of, I think, the keys of Berkeley GW is that we're trying to be sort of the best GW BSC uh, application out there, but we realize that there's lots of existing codes in the DFT space for us to leverage. Um, and so we've tried to be agnostic to the set of mean field codes that you can use. So, for example, um, the application sports quantum espresso, Avenant, Paratech, Octopus, Parsec, Siesta, and, uh, and others. Um, and uh, in addition to supporting all those different types of material geometries, we also support different um, uh, kind of electronic structures like uh, semiconductors, insulators, um, as well as metallic and semi-metallic systems. Um, and um, one of the other really defining characteristics of the code is that uh, we've really spent a lot of time focusing on performance and particularly scalability of the code on today's like leadership class 
HPC systems. So that includes scaling up to uh, like full system scale on these biggest systems. So you know, you can think about on the scale of a million or half half a million CPU cores, as well as the ability to leverage GPU accelerators, which is becoming more and more important on um, high performance computing or HPC systems um, that are being deployed these days. And uh, another, of course, important aspect is that this uh, application is free and open source. And in fact, we actually welcome any contributions that uh, you all might be able to bring to the to the application. Um, and just to highlight that uh, the point about the HPC performance, um, one of the reasons why that's important is that it can let you study um, really some of the biggest uh, materials that are relevant for today's like energy applications, for example, uh, complex uh, systems with interfaces, um, with nanostructured uh, geometries, and with things like defects, uh, which is the example that we're showing here, which is a silicon crystal with 2,700 atoms uh, with uh, you know a defect kind of in the in the center. And you can see the ability to scale to tens of thousands of GPUs on um, the, uh, what, what, what is the summit system at um, Oak Ridge National Lab. Okay, so here's kind of the outline of what I wanna talk about over the next 40 or so minutes. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk about the application. That's what we just sort of have passed. And then I wanna talk about some of the details of the implementation of the code that, um, uh, that you've been kind of working through in the tutorial over the last uh, couple of days. And then uh, we'll take some time at the end, hopefully for any questions that you, um, that have come up during the presentation or, or from some of the tutorials that you've worked on uh, so far. So in terms of the introduction, I think you've heard a lot about this from the other speakers already, um, but the core of a GW calculation is the calculation of the self energy, which essentially replaces sort of the exchange correlation um, operator that you might be used to in a DFT calculation. Um, some of the complications here is that this is uh, both non-local and energy uh, dependent um, or as expressed in the, the, the time domain here. Um, this is a uh, base, this is a kind of a product of these two terms, G and W. Uh, so G here stands for the Green's function. And I always like to joke that in GW, kind of W just stands for W, which is the symbol for the screened Coulomb interaction. Um, so in order to build W, what you need is the dielectric matrix, or to be more specific, the inverse dielectric matrix. Um, and uh, of course the Coulomb interaction and so what we end up doing here is computing the RPA dielectric matrix, which you can see uh, expressed here, um, which is uh, computed from the non-interacting polarizability matrix. Um, and at the end of the day, um, this is essentially the, um, the type of quantities at the bottom here, this non-interacting Green's function um, and polarizability that we are uh, interested in building uh, in the first step of the GW, kind of a practical GW calculation. Um, a couple things to note here is that this Coulomb interaction involves a sum over wave vectors Q, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the difference between kind of Q and K are in a second. Um, and then importantly, we have a sum over all occupied and unoccupied states that come into these expressions. 
um, and that is the the sum over m n sorry n that you are seeing in the in the formula. Um, okay, so the I think there's um, a workflow that we can show here that uh, you've already kind of been working through in the tutorial. So you start with a mean field calculation, and that's what we typically um, uh, utilize a DFT application for, um, often quantum espresso. And so as part of that mean field calculation, you're generating some initial wave functions. Um, you're exporting the exchange correlation or the VXC uh, matrix elements and the charge density uh, row. Um, and these are the different file names that those are encapsulated in when you convert those to Berkeley GW format. You input the two wave uh, a set of wave functions, and I'll talk a little bit more about why you need these two files in a minute. Uh, a wave function on um, a K grid and a wave function on a slightly shifted K grid. You input those into the epsilon code, and the epsilon code will spit out the dielectric matrix matrices, actually the inverse dielectric matrices are what is stored in these two files, F0MAT and EPSMAT, um, or the HDFI versions. And then you take that data along with some of the data that you produce from that mean field step, input it into the sigma executable as a second step to get the quasi-particle energies um, out, which is typically the, uh, the, the quantity of interest in a GW calculation. Um, as I mentioned, there's different DFT codes you can use. I think quantum espresso being one of the, the more popular um, applications to use. And these two steps are, of course, are part of the Berkeley GW um, package. OK, so let me talk about those, those wave function files and why you have these uh, multiple files and what we mean when we say k-point and q-point grids. Um, so as we mentioned here, the non-interacting polarizability has the sum over k-points, um, but it's also a function of q uh, itself. And so in particular, when you run a DFT calculation, you can kind of use any regular k-point grid that you want. You can kind of shift this in any way that you want. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be gamma-centered. Um, often it is, but maybe often it's, it's not. Um, but what you see here is that you have uh, wave functions as, as a uh, as a set of um, values on this K grid, but then to construct the polarizability, what you need is another set of wave functions here, the, the, the valence wave functions on a um, grid that is shifted from that grid at the Q values from which you want to compute the polarizability. So you need both uh, wave functions on your original grid plus a grid um, shifted from that original grid by those Q values. Um, and uh, you can see that we typically uh, calculate the polarizability on a gamma-centered grid. So with that includes Q equals zero. Um, and in practice, what we do is we set the grid of Q points to be all of the values K prime, I guess, minus K on that original grid that you, that you set. Um, so as a trick to get started, especially for um, bulk systems, the simplest thing you can do is choose your DFT grid to be um, uh, also a gamma, gamma centered grid. And then both your K and Q points are essentially the same. 
Um, there's one uh, complication though. So if you look at kind of the formula for epsilon, um, you have, uh, it, if you go back to the expression I showed a few slides ago, it's one minus the Coulomb interaction times that polarizability matrix. And there's kind of an issue is uh, you can't directly compute this at Q equals zero because you have this divided by zero squared in the, uh, in the expression. So um, for uh, gap systems, semiconductors or insulators, what we do is essentially use a trick. Um, we, instead of computing epsilon at Q exactly equal to zero, we can, we just compute it at Q uh, close, but not quite zero. Um, so for example, the, uh, what I'm showing here is at a Q of 0 0.001 in terms of the reciprocal lattice vector. So just a small, um, a small Q shift. And so what this requires is that we use two sets of wave functions where we have one at an original K point grid. Uh, it could be gamma centered, it could not, it, it also could not be. Um, and then we generate a second set of wave functions um, for just the valence states at a slightly shifted grid uh, from that original one with this uh, extra shift of the Q0 vector that we want. Um, so we have an original wave function file, and then we have a second wave function file that we own, that uh, provides just the valence states where uh, we have this additional small Q shift from the, the, the WFN grid. Um, so essentially what happens then is for all Q points that are not zero, um, we compute the dielectric matrix by using the original wave function file and then all of the different Q points that are the, the differences in the K points the K, K prime minus Ks in the file. And then for the special point Q equals to zero, we use this trick where instead of calculating it exactly at zero, we calculate it with a small shift using two separate wave function files where the grids are just slightly shifted from each other by that small Q zero uh, vector that we're going to um, used to approximate zero. Okay, so um, this is uh, kind of the explanation for what you were seeing in the input files yesterday is that when you construct the input file for epsilon, you tell the, um, the, the application which Q points you want to calculate the epsilon or inverse epsilon or inverse dielectric matrix on. And uh, there's a little trick here to tell it which of your points is meant to represent zero. And uh, that is shown here in this first line. We're saying calculate the Q point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 001, but treat this one as if it was zero. And what the code will then do is generate a separate output file for that point. It's called EPS zero mat, which means that this is meant to be the Q equals zero value for epsilon. Um, and then all of the other Q points go into this separate file, EPS mat. Um, and uh, there are a couple caveats with this. So everything I've been kind of talking about so far uh, applies to gap systems, but one of the complications is that for metals, you have to be kind of extra careful because um, the uh, screening or the dielectric properties depend kind of critically on sampling the density of states uh, 
uh, around the Fermi surface um, for these intraband transitions, not just interband transitions. And so this trick that I've been talking about is sort of insufficient for those. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we handle that situation in a minute. Um, and then one other thing that I want to mention is that uh, the additional steps in the GWBSC process uh, via sigma kernel absorption uh, will then use the Q grid that's defined by these files throughout the rest of the, of the workflow. Um, so here's an example output that you've been seeing from the Epsilon code. Uh, and I want to talk about a few points here. So one is uh, it'll tell you what the Q value is um, that the code is, is working on. Um, it tells you the number of K points in the wave function grid that is being summed over. Um, and then at the end of the day, it tells you the value of the, the G and G prime equals zero components of the, um, of, the uh, of the matrix. And so this, uh, if this is your Q equals zero point, what this refers to is essentially the dielectric constant, um, the head, the, what we call the head of the matrix or the zero, zero component of the matrix uh, refers to that um, kind of macroscopic dielectric constant for the, for the, the, the Q equals zero point. Um, okay, so, so far, I think what we've talked about uh, is the epsilon step. Uh, and kind of explaining why epsilon outputs both an eps mat file and an f zero mat file, and uh, why this epsilon step requires two different input files, WFN and the WFNQ. Um, and I'm going to put this up just as a um, kind of uh, cheat sheet. So you can, I think, download these slides and you can use this table as a, as a cheat sheet for the, what these different file names typically mean. So, so far what we've seen is, um, you know, the simplest thing to do is to run your DFT on a uniform grid with no shift. And then you construct WFN on that same grid and then WFNQ will be on that grid with a small Q shift. And you actually only need the valence or the occupied states for that Q shifted grid. Um, okay, so let's talk about the difference between semiconductors, metals, and why there's a little bit of uh, nuance or subtlety to those calculations. Um, so, uh, one of the things that's relevant here is how do we use that epsilon matrix or the uh, inverse dielectric functions that we've compute that we've computed to actually compute sigma or the self energy itself. Um, and we do that by um, essentially doing first order perturbation theory. So sandwiching sigma between the um, uh, wave functions that we've gotten out of our mean field calculation as a first guess to the uh, quasi-particle wave functions. And if you look at this, what it comes down to is a relatively smooth function, um, uh, which is the, the basically the G here times W of Q. And then there's the sum over Q or the integral over, over Q. Um, and so what we want to do is look at the Q dependence of W um, sort of carefully to see how, uh, how, how to best do that integral or that summation. Um, and one of the things that we note is that this integral or the summation is, has fairly slow convergence in terms of the sum over Q since W of Q uh, may pre present uh, divergence for gap systems, and then also fast variation at 
and around Q equals zero, especially for like nanostructured systems, as I'll show in a second. Um, so one of the issues is the divergent behavior around Q equals zero. So W is a product of epsilon inverse and V. Um, and V is the Coulomb interaction. So it's one, basically one over Q squared. Um, and the issue is that this behaves differently for different types of si systems. So for a semiconductor, um, what happens is that epsilon inverse, um, so let's talk about the G equals zero, G prime equals zero component, which is the head for a second. So epsilon inverse goes to basically a constant as Q goes to zero for a semiconductor. So for um, like silicon, we know that the, you know, the dielectric constant, uh, um, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, uh, one to, to 10 for, for many, um, for, for many semiconductors. Uh, so the inverse dielectric constant would be, you know, roughly of order, um, uh, one tenth to, to one. Um, however, for a metal, the dielectric function uh, essentially goes to infinity or the inverse dielectric function goes to zero as a function of Q squared um, as, uh, as Q nears zero. Um, so essentially you have infinite screening at at uh, long distances or perfect screening at long distances in, in a middle. Um, so this, this behavior is different and it's important to, to recognize that differences. And so what happens when you, when you construct W, which is epsilon inverse times V, remember V is like one over Q squared, is that for a semiconductor, W diverges, whereas for a metal, W is then a constant because we have like a Q squared over a Q squared um, effect happening. And so this is different behavior um, that affects the way that we, we can uh, effectively calculate this integral or this summation over Q. Um, and so the solution that the Berkeley GW code has put in is uh, essentially asking the user to provide a hint about what screening uh, model to, to use. Um, and so in the input file, you can specify screening semiconductor, screening metal, or screening graphene, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's essentially if, uh, if the divergence goes like one over Q instead of one over Q squared. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to say is that the calculation is still ab initio. Uh, the screening model is just a hint that the user gives Berkeley GW to improve the convergence rate. Um, you'll, you know, it, essentially you always get the right answer if you um, uh, provide enough K and Q points, but providing this hint will help you get to that right answer faster, converge faster. Um, by uh, helping us do the best we can to um, improve that k-point sampling. Um, the the next uh, the next thing I want to highlight is that uh, in nanostructured systems, um, there's a additional challenge here that uh, the dielectric matrix. Um, can be uh, especially sensitive to um, Q, especially near Q equals zero. So here's an example of the inverse dielectric function as a, fun as a function of Q um, in terms of uh, basically reciprocal lattice vectors. And uh, you see that there's a lot of variation near Q equals zero. Most of the interesting structure is actually happening in this region near Q equals zero. Um, and so you have to make sure that you capture 
that structure within your Q grid or your K point grid um, in, uh, in order to get a converged calculation. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, another um, point to talk about here is for those nanostructured systems, it's also important to include uh, um, a truncation method to prevent the um, nanostructure that you're interested in um, studying the properties of having kind of spurious interactions with neighbors in the periodic cells that are constructed as part of the calculation when you uh, kind of implicitly use uh, a plane wave um, basis set. And so um, in your input file, you can specify cell box truncation, which essentially truncates uh, in all three spatial directions. Uh, you can specify a wire truncation as if you're studying, um, uh, for example, a nanotube or a nanowire and slab truncation if you're studying a system like graphene that's sort of two, two dimensional. Um, and uh, you can input those into the Epsilon um, input file with these different keywords um, that again help with the convergence um, of the quantities that you're uh, studying. Um, I want to quickly just talk about the frequency dependence of Epsilon and how we handle that in the application. Um, so in principle, when you're computing sigma, um, sigma is actually energy dependent, which is one of the things that makes a GW calculation a little bit more complicated than a, um, a DFT calculation uh, with, within a typical exchange correlation approximation. Um, <clears throat> and in principle, what you need is uh, epsilon, uh, where the, the, you need the screen coolant direction as a function of energy, uh, which would require epsilon as a function of, of energy. So we often use a simplification of this uh, where we model the uh, energy dependence of the dielectric matrix uh, through what is called a plasmon pole model. Um, which uses sort of a physical model to um, constrain and obtain epsilon at omega not equal to zero using um, uh, properties of the charge density. So this is uh, the reason why you need to include rho in a typical calculation um, within Berkeley GW. Um, this model is uh, the default option within the code, and it's typically a good idea for your first calculation. Um, but there is the ability to use a full frequency calculation um, that uh, explicitly calculates epsilon at omega not equals to zero, um, and will do the integral um, uh, over omega uh, explicitly. Actually, we do it via a trick where uh, instead of integrating on the real axis, we uh, use a contour deformation approach to integrate on the imaginary axis. Uh, but you end up needing to uh, compute epsilon on a grid of energy values um, to uh, to do that calculation. So this is why we typically recommend doing the, uh, the default of the plasmon pole model first. Um, a, a quick note here about the symmetry and degeneracy check that I think you're kind of running into in your tutorials as well. Um, and the point here is that depending on your choice of number of bands to use at various points in the calculation, um, you can 
break symmetry or you can end up in the middle of a degenerate set of states. And this can in principle lead to sort of arbitrary results if you include only um, a fraction of a degenerate set of, of, of states in your calculation. The code will essentially warn you about this. Um, and there's a, a routine called degeneracycheck.x that will help you find a good number of bands to use uh, at various um, at various points in the calculation uh, that does not break degeneracies. Um, so this is based, uh, I think, on the silicon example in the tutorial, and you can uh, find that uh, these would be good values to use as the total number of bands in epsilon. Um, at where the degeneracy check is most important is when you're computing the self-energy correction for a set of bands. What you want to make sure is that if you're computing the self-energy for, uh, let's say, one band near the gap of a semiconducting system, that you include all of its degenerate uh, pairs. Um, what is less important is uh, in the example here where um, you're just telling it how many bands that you want to sum over in, uh, in terms of the empty states in an epsilon or sigma calculation. Um, it turns out that you know, as long as you have kind of a lot of empty states, uh, whether the top one is part of a degenerate or set, uh, probably doesn't matter very, very much. Um, and so you could, in that case, turn off this degeneracy enforcement with the degeneracy check override flag. So that's what we're saying here is that it's okay if it's part of the, you know, many unoccupied bands that you're summing over, um, but likely not okay if it's part of the bands that you actually want to calculate the self-energy for. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that piece now. So um, when we solve the Dyson's equation in sigma, um, what we typically do is we, uh, at the end of the day, want the kind of quasi-particle band structure, the quasi-particle energies out. And we do this typically in like a perturbation theory approach where we start with the mean field. You can think of these as like the DFT energies. And then we um, uh, correct them by computing the self energy uh, of those wave functions minus what is referred to here as sigma mean field, which is essentially the VXC exchange correlation potential from the DFT calculation. Um, one complication, again, is that sigma is an energy dependent operator. And so what we need to do here is do this sort of self consistently, that the energy that should go in here is the quasi particle energy. But how do we do that if we don't actually know what the quasi particle energy is yet? Um, and so we do this uh, in a couple steps. So one is we start by calculating the first guess at what EQP uh, would be by computing the self energy at that initial mean field value or the DFT energies, for example, that are uh, input into the calculation. Uh, so this gives us our first guess at the direction in which uh, EQP is changing as a function of the input energy into sigma. Um, and then uh, we can kind of solve this self consistently. Um, typically what we do is we assume that the dependence of sigma on this input energy that you use is linear. And if you do that, um, you can uh, use like a simple um, Newton sort of method solution to solve this self consistently. And so, the final or self-consistent EQP uh, is based on that first guess and the kind of the slope of the linear curve, so d sigma dE, uh, 
Um, and we uh, approximate this derivative by just simply calculating sigma at that mean field energy and then a energy slightly shifted from that mean field energy automatically in the code to um, uh, to guess to to kind of approximate what this what this slope would be. Um, so this is why uh, when you run a sigma calculation, you need to also provide the VXC. Um, and it's essentially so that we can subtract it out. Um, and there's two formats that Berkeley GW accepts for VXC. There's a kind of a binary file containing the actual operator in a reciprocal space, or there's a ASCII file, vxc.dat, that ju just actually contains these matrix elements, the NK, uh, I guess the NK here, VXC, NK. Um, and uh, again, the point of sending these in to the, the sigma or the Berkeley GW calculation is really just so we can subtract subtract them out of the mean field energies that we read from the wave function files. Um, Berkeley GW also supports uh, some hybrid functionals. Um, so uh, we can also um, uh, support that by having the user separate this bear, uh, uh, specify, sorry, the bare exchange fraction for the sigma code so that, um, you know, the sigma that is used within Berkeley GW also contains a bare exchange. Um, and so what we need to know is what fraction of VXC should be left in because it includes that, um, that bare exchange component. Okay, so I'm, I'm probably running a little bit long here. Um, so I'm gonna now move on to BSC um, and I'll try to make this quick and probably I'll, I'll try to wrap up in the next uh, five to 10, 10 minutes and then we can take questions. So <clears throat> um, why, I kind of want to start off with just talking about why the beta saltpeter equation is important. I know that you saw some of this from um, Steve and, and Mauro and, 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 uh, and others already, but um, the importance can kind of be demonstrated in these various plots here. So I'm just gonna kind of make them all visible. But um, what you're seeing in these different plots is the calculation of the optical absorption that you would get uh, in comparison to experiment with and without electron hole contributions or like the BSE type contributions included in your calculation. And so particularly in the silicon uh, example, if you were to just take your DFT mean field result and compute an optical spectra, you get this dashed line, uh, whereas you, where as if you compute the full interacting uh, optical spectra, you get the solid line, which uh, tends to agree with experiment that the dots here um, a lot better. Um, and it's a similar story for these, uh, probably even more important actually for these nanostructured systems. Um, and so <clears throat> the, the theory of what's happening here is that um, if you think about what happens when uh, you know light is shined on a material, uh, it's absorbed by uh, kind of promoting a electron from a valence band to a conduction band or an occupied band to an unoccupied band. Um, and typically in uh, you know the mean field picture, you calculate this by calculating these uh, transition probabilities between the valence state here and the conduction state with the you know momentum of a photon being included as the as the Q. Um, so one uh, 
deficiency of this simple picture so far is that we're neglecting the interaction between the excited uh, electron or quasi electron and the quasi hole. Um, whereas uh, in reality, the, um, the picture is a little bit more complicated in that um, as the incoming photon excites the quasi electron and quasi hole, those two particles interact and the energy is, is uh, renormalized um, based on that interaction. Um, and the true excited state ends up not being um, a simple uh, single quasi whole state and a simple quasi electron state or a simple, yeah, quasi electron state, but actually a, a mix of uh, various states near the band edge from both the valence band and the conduction band. So it's sort of a sum over several uh, K points, for example, near the band edge. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the proper way to compute these properties is by solving what we call the beta saltpeter um, equation and looking for the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this equation. I think you've heard a, a bit about this, so I'm going to try to go quickly and um, computing the optical properties not as a sum over these kind of individual transitions between valence and conduction states, but um, uh, transitions between the ground state and these correlated um, excited states. <clears throat> so um, the beta saltpeter Hamiltonian looks like the following. It has that non-interacting component that uh, that would give you kind of like the DFT picture plus this interacting component, which is a dense sort of mixing of the different K points and bands that are near the energy transition that you are interested in. Um, one of the complications that I should mention is that uh, this, even more so than in GW, requires a, a very fine sampling of the K point grid. And so um, we, uh, we've shown that we kind of already know how to interpolate the quasi-particle corrections. And can we do something about, uh, about the kernel in order to compute the kernel on a dense, a more dense k-point grid? Um, so here are some of the challenges. So computing the kernel matrix elements is fairly expensive. Um, so computing it directly on um, the fine grid is a challenge because we would actually need to have like W would have to need to have the dielectric matrix on the fine grid uh, in order to do that. Um, so what we typically do is we actually compute kernel on a coarse grid similar to the grid that we would use in the GW calculation. Um, typically, we want to use the same EPSMAT and F0MAT files that you computed in GW and then interpolate those to the fine grid. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple choices for how we could do that. Uh, I'm just going to say that the way that we end up doing it for a number of reasons is um, using a explicit construction of both wave function files on the coarse and fine grid. Uh, in order to um, in order to do that interpolation, so um, what we first do is uh, ask the user to basically obtain the wave functions on both the coarse grid, which is typically the grid that you computed the the GW step on, as well as the fine grid, which is the grid that we'd like to compute the beta saltpeter uh, solution on. And then we construct an expansion of the fine wave functions in terms of those coarse wave functions. So 
um, the periodic part of the wave function on the fine grid can be expanded in terms of the periodic function from the coarse grid. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, one caveat here is that in order for this to be accurate, you tend to need to have more bands on the coarse grid than you need to have on the fine grid, uh, or than that you have on the fine grid in order to converge. Um, and then we interpolate the quasi-particle energies and finally, we interpolate the BSE kernel matrix elements by using those coefficients um, that we have uh, that we have calculated above. Uh, so, a couple caveats about this is um, that uh, again, there is some sensitivity to uh, the the Q, which is like the delta between different K points on the fine grid um, that depends again on the screening type. So whether you have a semiconductor, a metal uh, or semi-metal like, um, like system. And uh, we again ask the user to give us a hint in order to help make the convergence process as efficient as possible. Um, <clears throat> And I'll kind of skip a little bit of the details there, but it's the same same sort of uh, reasoning behind the hint in the GW step. Um, and so in principle, what you can think about this interpolation scheme as doing is trading bands for K points. So we want to calculate the kernel on more um, bands than we necessarily want on the coarse grid in order to end up with a calculation on a finer set of K points um, on, the, on the fine grid. Um, okay, so uh, the trick to get a good interpolation then is to use kind of a larger number of bands on the coarse grid um, and of course, to the one trick to get accurate or to have improved convergence is to start off with a coarse grid that's also not too coarse. Um, so one of the questions that comes up as you're doing a beta salt peter calculation is how do you know if you have enough bands? And uh, one of the ways that we can do that is by calculating the norm of the interpolated wave functions on the fine grid. So remember, you're, you're constructing the fine grid wave functions as a sum over bands on the coarse grid. Um, and what you'd like to see is that this is close to one, so that you're, cap, you're encapsulating the, um, you know, all the qualities of the wave functions on that fine grid. Uh, and you can actually see these norms reported in two important files that are output from the beta saltpeter code, um, dvmat and dcmat. Um, okay, so this brings us to essentially the end here. So here's the whole Ber Berkeley GW workflow. So you start by calculating um, the quasi-particle corrected band structure through the um, GW steps that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and then within the beta saltpeter step, uh, there are actually two different components to run. So step one is to compute the BSE kernel on the coarse grid. And we've highlighted here that this is the same, essentially the same coarse grid that you've used to run your GW calculation. And then there's a second step that interpolates that uh, BSE kernel onto a fine grid. It builds the Hamiltonian and then eventually diagonalizes it to find the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian and construct the absorption spectra. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip over this because I think I'm about out of time. Um, a couple, uh, you can kind of check out the slides to um, which describe a little bit of the input files and um, 
skipping here to the end. Um, The, con the conclusion is that uh, of, of the BSC step is that BSC really does need to be solved on a very fine grid of K points. Uh, we use an interpolation strategy in order to do that, which involves um, first constructing the interacting kernel or the BSC kernel on a coarse grid and then um, interpolating it to a fine grid. And this explains why you need these additional wave function files, WFN FI, WFN QFI, in order to do that interpolation. Um, and if we add these two steps to our earlier GW workflow, you end up with the following complete GW beta saltpeter equation workflow for calculating and interacting um, absorption spectra that includes the electron hole uh, interaction contribution. Um, and that uh, is the end of my presentation and I hope it explains kind of in more detail a lot of what you've been doing in the tutorial and I'm happy uh, to now take any any questions you may have about the, the presentation or the things that you've you've heard here this morning. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, we have indeed a few questions, um, and uh, I think we can use like a five minutes uh, here to answer some of them. And uh, in case um, you can type the answer for those we we won't be able to answer uh, online. So, okay. how to know when we require gamma center grid or a shift grid like um, N X N Y N Z one one one? I have seen some. Epsilon calculation, sometimes people use gamma center grid and sometimes shift grid, um, as I've mentioned above. So how, how to decide yeah. using a gamma center or a shifted one? Right. So that, that's a good question. Um, and I think in the beginning of the presentation, we suggested as your first, uh, like as a first go through, you could just use a gamma centered grid. Um, and the first point I want to make is that uh, you will uh, you'll get the right answer um, essentially no matter what grid you use as long as it is as long as it's dense enough. So the choice of using a gamma centered grid or a shifted grid is really just about um, which one will converge fastest in terms of the grid density or like the n by n by n size of the grid. Um, and so um, what people find is that for some applications, you can, like for some systems, I guess I should say, you can uh, get faster convergence if you shift away from gamma. And the reason why you might want to do that is that with a gamma centered grid, a lot of the points on your grid, so let's say you do a you know, four by four by four grid on silicon, for example, or, or diamond, with uh, with without any shift, what you'll find is that a lot of the points on that on that grid are actually equivalent due to to symmetry, and so you're not actually sampling maybe um, as many unique points on the in the Brion zone as you might think you you are, and so if you shift away from gamma, you end up. Um, maybe sampling more independent points on the on the Brion zone than um, than you would with an unshifted grid, and so it can be a trick in some systems to uh, achieve uh, faster convergence with the same like n by n by n value by shifting away from from gamma. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I want to to mm -hmm. talk about uh, real quick is that the Q grid though is always unshifted because the Q grid is constructed essentially as the difference between the various K values on your K grid. Yeah. So I think this is also kind of um, introduced in the next question, which is if the small Q shift is small enough, why uh, not just use the shift grid for all Q points rather than having two different grid for Q equals zero and Q not equals zero? 
does this introduce large error? Um, so I, I think, it, I guess if I understand the question, it's, is, uh, I guess, why not use, uh, yeah, if the Q, if the Q equals zero value is small enough, why not just use that for all of your Q points right. instead of using the K minus K prime mm -hmm. value? Um, and I guess the answer is you could, you could in principle do that, uh, but I think then the calculation might actually be somewhat more expensive. <laughs> I mean, I don't, maybe Mauer, you have a better answer. I mean, I think in principle that would work, but the calculation would actually be a little bit more expensive because in that case, you right. wouldn't be using yeah. symmetry at all. Mm -hmm. um, also, we need the small Q just for the gamma point. Um, for all other points, we don't have any divergent terms, so we don't need yeah. to shift. Um, so it's not, it, yeah, so it's certainly not necessary for any other Q point. Um, right, so maybe I can, just one quick one, I'm gonna just jump over. Does the Coulomb truncation avoid interaction with substrate also? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it depends on how you set up your calculation. So if you wanted to include a substrate in your calculation, you would, you would need to either have the substrate like actually in your geometry in like the DFT calculations that you run, or you would need to model, add in this like the screening behavior from the substrate as an extra model into the GW calculations. So, um, I, I would say that the short answer is uh, probably like if you if you're trying to calculate the properties of a molecule on a substrate, then you probably need to um, think beyond uh, what a basic molecular calculation within Berkeley GW does. Um, mm -hmm. You either need to actually have the substrate in your DFT calculation, or you would need to model, add in an additional component to the dielectric function. Um, and so I think maybe the answer to that, that question is it's not entirely relevant, but if, if you're studying a molecule with like box truncation, you're, pro you're explicitly not including any substrate in your calculation. So you need to maybe think, think more about how to do that correctly. All right, um, so there are a few other questions. Uh, we can maybe um, you know move to the next talk and we can type in the, uh, the answer to those questions on the uh, live chat. And with that, thank you again, uh, Jack, and we can move on to